Welcome back. This is a visionary moment in Detroit and at the University of Detroit Law School. Detroit is, in many respects, an open field of opportunity. It is also a microcosm of what many other cities are experiencing. But having heard from our former speech speakers and the like, we know that we are right on the precipice of doing some phenomenal things here in Detroit. So I welcome you back to this special moment, to the third and final part of the University of Detroit Mercy Law Review Symposium, entitled A Centennial Celebration, the Past, Present, and Future of Detroit. And of course, we are dealing with what in many respects is the most important thing, Detroit going forward. We are privileged today to have two extremely dynamic professors, Professor Andrea Boyack from the faculty at Washburn University, where she is an associate professor and co-director of the Business and Transactional Law Center. And she's also written extensively about property and contracts law. We also welcome home Professor Sanders, a native Detroiter, who is now with the faculty at the University of Idaho College of Law, where she teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and the First Amendment. So I welcome you all back to this special moment in time. Welcome, professors. We thank you. We're going to begin with Professor Boyack. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful honor and humbling for me to be here. I am not a native Detroiter, although I'll tell you, from hearing all of the wonderful things discussed today and from everything I've learned about the city, I sort of wish I was. Um, I, I don't think that it's possible for someone who is not from the city to come and, and give the city a vision. But what I sort of want to try to do today, humbly, is sort of hold up a mirror to the things that I've seen from the people and the background and the history and the current um, challenges and opportunities uh, in, the, in Detroit to help maybe crystallize some of the issues that we have going forward and some of the ways that the vision that you or the people in Detroit have for its city have uh, can affect that vision. Um, one thing that I've noticed as we've talked today is that Detroit, and I already had this impression, is that Detroit really rises or falls on the big question that plagues mankind, right? Do we work together or do we work against each other? Cooperation or conflict? And throughout Detroit's history, for hundreds of years, this has been sort of a pivotal question. And I think once again, we are um, posed on the edge of figuring out where to go forward. We just came off of a great panel talking about a triumph of cooperation over conflict. But previously, we had a panel where we talked about decades and all kinds of horrible conflicts, and yet glimmers of cooperation. And very much we are at this sort of phoenix moment, I think, in Detroit's history, where uh, it will be a question of whether we can harness the human ingenuity and creativity and, and really the human spirit that has inspired the city from the beginning and led it to great things in the past to move to another new beginning in the future, or whether the, uh, the conflicts that continue to, to fester and cause continuing trouble in the city will uh, overtake I hope not, but those visions and dreams for the future. Um, so yesterday, I came into town early so I could drive around and take pictures. And I don't want to show you my own ruined porn, but I, I pose this not as something that we can gape at, like as if we're going, to, you know, looking at an accident on the side of the road. Because I would like to look at this in a different way. I'd like to think of the the vacant properties and the some of the problems with blight that we have in the city here as, as an opportunity, as giving um, a unique opportunity for Detroit to maybe take the very difficult step of addressing some long-seated persistent problems that have plagued its past and create a more sustainable future. Um, Martin Luther King had a vision for equitable, integrated, high-quality housing, and I think that that can be achieved in being in a place that's as segregated as Detroit. Clearly, we are not there yet, and the problems that plague the entire country are really probably most keenly seen in Detroit. That's why it's so fascinating to talk about Detroit. These are not 
uh, as you mentioned, these are not unique Detroit issues, but I think when it comes to uh, seeing them in high relief, Detroit gives an interesting um, situation that we see across the United States. Prosperous, vibrant nation, but pockets and neighborhoods and communities that are depressed and are decaying and are dying. We have poor areas and we have failing urban cores and inner suburbs. We have abandoned new developments. We have racially fragmented cities. The American dream has always been one of equal opportunity, but we have success in this dream is required to begin at home. And historically and today, there are different contexts for American homes. Um, very, very briefly, just because we did not have a chance to get into this last half century as much as probably it merits. Um, can I go forward? Yes. We have, um, for decades, a situation where minority races were systematically denied mortgage capital and homes in white communities through uh, combined efforts of governments and white realtors, landlords, and communities. Um, of course, this is common knowledge. We know that there was redlining. We know that there was steering. We know that there were racial covenants that eventually were outlawed. We know that in Detroit in particular, there have been decades and centuries actually of racial tensions and this has driven the city not to find a solution but really to, to devolve into two different realities um, with white flight from the cities, having a lot of different um, tensions and a lot of different riots um, and a changing demographic. And this changing demographic was key to driving the fiscal fortunes of the city into a terrible and unsustainable place. And, and this is not news to anybody, of course, but I think it's important that as we go forward and we have this wonderful opportunity that the solutions of bankruptcy have given and an opportunity for a new start that we also have from, from having um, property be freed up, that we confront and, and recognize and address the problem of residents in New York being far more segregated than a sustainable city should be. Um, in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, which is where I currently teach in Topeka, so there's a wonderful museum in the school where this all started, we had a holding that held school segregation was unconstitutional and that the segregation that existed throughout the country had to be remedied with all deliberate speed. That uh, particular quote is one that, of course, is now cited with quite a bit of irony because, of course, deliberate speed was not something that seemed to happen very speedily. Ah, back. Okay. So in, um, in Detroit, we have a very important case that was just about 41 years ago um, where there were efforts made, and I think what's the most interesting thing about this case is actually what happened before the case in Mel Kidby Bradley, there were efforts made to address the segregation issue, particularly in the context of schools. But instead of addressing the schooling as a, as a discrete issue, um, the, the Board of Education said, well, we're not just going to improve certain schools, we're going to redraw the whole plan so we can have different sorts of populations supporting different kinds of schools. That was done in 1970, and immediately there was a very harsh backlash by white populations in particular that said they did not want to have schools integrated. They recalled the elected members of the school board that had done this, and they um, set up a new approach. And the Missouri, I mean the Michigan State Legislature packed the Public Act 48, and um, they decided that they would localize school districts by neighborhood. This was a pivotal decision because instead of having all of Detroit looked at in a holistic way and having allocation of resources that were larger, you had pockets of resources that were going to be vastly less full, less staff than other pockets. Um, this was something that the Public Act 48, that the NAACP led a group of parents in bringing a suit against, against the governor, saying that this was unconstitutional, that it inadequately gave, um, gave heed to the Brown v. Board mandate of integration and that it was um, necessary to do something very uh, active, not just sort of passively carve up the city, in order to address the historic harms that had been done to the city through deliberate segregation policies, housing segregation. And the judge in this case, the Eastern District of Michigan judge, Dodge Roth, agreed and he ordered a 
um, very pivotal and potentially infamous uh, buzzing, buzzing solution. But before we get to that, I just want to mention that the government here, it, in general, everywhere, especially in Detroit, is culpable for the segregation of housing. And just quickly, this is true because you have government policies that promoted it actively. I found it a little shocking to go back and read FHA policy manuals from the 1930s that specifically told developers and realtors and communities that they better put in racial covenants, they better do racial steering, they better keep these races separate because otherwise it was going to drive down population, I mean, drive down property values, and after all, that was the holy grail of lending. Um, and we have real estate associations very deliberately and, and clearly, transparently, steering populations. In fact, it's still going on today. And practices of mortgage lenders, which starve certain areas of credit that they would need to acquire property. When we talk about the history of home ownership in this country, we really are talking about the history of white home ownership because black home ownership was not something that was promoted by the government. In fact, if anything, it was inhibited by it. Um, because of these sorts of things, we have a racially segregated housing market in Detroit as in elsewhere, and the suburban schools, once they were able to separate themselves politically and financially, there was no real question of integration that would occur naturally because you would have to move people from one place to another in order to get a school that was integrated, and that led to Judge Roth's plan. This plan was um, held as being the only way to solve the problem that had been created and perpetuated by the government, but the um, Sixth Circuit, even though it was affirmed, it was eventually thrown out by the Supreme Court, who found that it would unfairly penalize suburbs, and the suburbs hadn't caused the segregation, therefore that was not the right approach. Um, I, I point this out, even though this is a sort of historic moment, to show this opportunity that was missed. And hopefully that we can take from it a new opportunity for today. And instead of thinking within the little boxes that we've made, maybe think outside of the box and say, clearly we need to address housing segregation. I think that a lot of the other ills of the city, tensions, inequality of wealth, inequality of opportunity in schools, a lot of these can be vastly ameliorated, if not solved, if we can truly integrate housing. Of course, the Fair Housing Act was passed, and you might think this is no longer a problem, but of course it really truly is. Today we have basically two Americas and it is nowhere probably as apparent as in Detroit. This is a lovely map, I'm sure you've seen it. It has dots that the Census Bureau has put up. Blue dots indicating white households and green dots indicating black households and there's a very, very clear line, um, clearer in Detroit than almost anywhere. Before the housing boom, we had continued problems of separate yet unequal housing realities and all the realities that came with that in Detroit with schools and uh, vacant homes and infrastructure falling apart. This uh, racial steering evidence that we saw didn't go away with the Fair Housing Act. In fact, it was still alive and well, well into the 21st century. High price subprime lending was a big run up to the crisis. But one of the biggest problems about the subprime lending is that it actually exacerbated the wealth inequality because it was targeted or most successful in minority neighborhoods. Some, some, um, gosh, some uh, statistics really are quite shocking. You're 30% more likely to have a subprime loan if you're in a minority neighborhood, no matter what the actual income profile of the borrower. And uh, minority neighborhoods provide, provided a cluster of credit-starved mortgage loan customers and they were aggressively marketed to and sold risky, costly subprime loans, many of these predatory. This was to fuel a mortgage-backed securitization industry that was hungry, in fact, uh, voraciously hungry for subprime loans. And the people who were put on the hook for these were the very people who historically for decades had been denied credit and been denied access to good homes. Um, four to five times higher rate of high-risk loans in some places even more, and even in high-income minority neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods were more likely to get subprime loans than in low-income white neighborhoods. Um, the pundits looked at the growing housing rate and the run-up to the crisis in 2008 as being a great benefit to minority neighborhoods and a way to bridge the wealth gap, but we know that this was built on a foundation of sand because it turns out that a lot of those home loans were never going to be sustainable, and indeed they weren't. 
Um, when the market turned and values fell, home ownership built upon the foundations was, became basically a trap. This is, I just have so many pictures because it's so fantastically obvious to me and I think that some of the data really drives home this point. Um, the fallout from, well, the, the trap that happened with the subprime lending siphoned wealth from the most vulnerable segments of society and it left people homeless and broke. And it left communities, as we see in Detroit, riddled with bank owned foreclosed and vacant foreclosure pending properties. This didn't start with the foreclosure crisis, especially in Detroit, but it was exacerbated there. Minority home buyers and minority communities have felt and are feeling the greatest losses from the downturn of uh, loss of manufacturing jobs, urban flight, and from the crisis as well. Um, the foreclosure crisis also exacerbated segregation and a lot of the social problems that have long played poor neighborhoods. These risky loans lead to home loss, the home loss leads to home vacancies, Home vacancies lead to neighborhood ruin. So in the USA today, we still have 13 million homes that are vacant, and that's 10% of our housing stock. By the way, it's enough to give every homeless person in the US six vacant homes. Um, in Detroit, we see this at an even greater level. We see uh, at least 84,000 properties which have, uh, which have 84,000 blight properties, 76 percent of which have gone through a foreclosure. Other ones have not been foreclosed, but they are still standing empty, pending foreclosure. One in three properties have been foreclosed already, and we have lots that have been um, removed and are empty. Um, even once property falls through a foreclosure and the banks are maintaining it, there's been pre presented a lot of evidence that banks do not treat different neighborhoods similarly in the way that homes are maintained. In fact, in minority neighborhoods, there are vastly lower levels of maintenance. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because it drives down property values and it creates a community unsafety. It creates all kinds of perception issues. And those things are going to be, once again, concentrated in the minority neighborhoods. We also have a problem of so-called zombie mortgages, where properties have not gone through foreclosure, but there's been a, either a commenced or a threatened foreclosure. For whatever reason, the homeowner is abandoned, and the lender doesn't even take title, and so it sits there in this sort of limbo for a long time. Um, vacancies are costing the city a lot of money. We have 45% um, of vacant land in Detroit is, un, is publicly owned, and money is bleeding out from this very um, precious fund that we need in the city to take care of vacant properties. Um, some of them have no structures, some of them have structures that are falling apart. And I found it quite fascinating, having spent quite a bit of time in Manhattan, that the volume of vacant land in Detroit is basically the size of Manhattan. So that's a tremendous amount of space. And it is costing not only the government, but it's costing people. You have $1.3 billion of property value loss in one year, um, let alone all the costs from crime and, and arson and blight. Basically, we are facing now destruction value that's similar to the destroyed value during the race riots, but not happening in maybe quite as dramatic a fashion. There are many problems to neighborhoods where we have home vacancies, including things like market instability, capital not available, social instability, crime rising, um, health and safety problems, spillover effects into properties that are not in foreclosure, are not facing any sort of problem, but then the, the neighbors are going down, so will they. We are all somewhat linked. Local government loss, huge waste of potential resources. And I think that these also dovetail with problems that continue to exist from housing segregation. And so I'm just going to put up a list here of those sorts of problems. We have these sort of twin problems facing us. We have these vacant properties that are plaguing neighborhoods, and at the same time we have the continued persistent segregation um, opportunity gaps from schools and increased rate of single parenthood, basically death and uh, civic participation diminished, um, predatory lending, and uh, decreased integration. So that's kind of all depressing, and I'm sorry to show you all of this, but it is a kind of depressing reality, and I think in the midst of feeling very hopeful, and hopefully we do feel hopeful, that we can get to a better place, it's important to confront the obstacles that have to be overcome. 
So how do we overcome them? How can we solve both of these problems at the same time? And I maintain that there is a way that we can maybe use um, vacant properties and some of the property loss that we've experienced as a way, as a launch pad to addressing the even more historically problematic and intractable problem of housing segregation in Detroit. And um, I think that it starts out with, with making a plan, with addressing and quantifying the problem and figuring out the right address ap approach to, um, to deal with the problem of different Detroits for different races and prioritizing the right sorts of development and the right sorts of laws that will pave the way to solve the problem. And then we're gonna to have to actually reallocate property uses to achieve that vision. And of course, this is going to take, it's all one, 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 I don't know why that happened. <laughs> it was one, two, three, once upon a time. And um, also how, how we're gonna achieve this in terms of, of money, because of course that's the entire, um, that's, the, that's the tricky part. So quickly, making the plan, I just want to mention a couple of thoughts quickly because we don't have enough time to flesh this all the way out because there's so much we could say. First point, we are becoming more and more a nation of renters and that's especially true for minority populations. But even in terms of younger populations of every race. And I think for a long time, planners and the government and people who are promoting quality of life from the from subsidies to people have focused on home ownership and home buying. I think we need to think in a different way, either focusing on promoting and establishing affordable rentals or focusing on a different path to home ownership. Home ownership is not a given anymore in this country and it's particularly not a given for um, minority races. And when we have reliance on rent, what we often have is rent that's overpriced in terms of what people can pay. And so if we have additional supply of rental housing, we should be able to see, just from market forces, a lower price of paying rent. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about gentrification. Because we have, it's true, in areas of Detroit that I've seen, uh, some of the pictures I didn't put out are not just the, uh, the, the pictures of blight, but the pictures of renewal. We need to be very careful because renewal is fantastic but we cannot come at the expense of disadvantaged neighborhoods and it cannot come in a way that just reiterates and perpetuates the segregation to restore Midtown and drive, or restore other areas, you know, uh, Indian Hills or something, and just drive people out of there that are from those neighborhoods would not be um, a step forward, it would just be a step backwards. Um, we do have some interesting developments going on in housing generally that I think can be tapped here. People are demanding more urban and walkable neighborhoods. Younger people aren't as interested in having big homes in the suburbs. They're more interested in sort of small communities within cities or within a sort of near suburb areas. And I think that there are some options when we make a plan in tapping these trends. Um, abandoned properties need to be focused on not just for the purposes of providing housing, but providing an actual sustainable community. And there are many segments of that community. You need to have um, the kind of amenities that keep people having a good quality of life there and having diverse types of places to live, not just single family houses, not just rental uh, single family houses, not just duplexes or triplexes or multifamily tall buildings, but bringing all these different types together. This is counter to the trend of zoning for the past hundred years in this country. For the past hundred years since Euclid, we have segregated uses, and for some reason, well, it's not for some reason, it really was a proxy for race segregation, they put rental housing over here and owning ho owner housing over here. And really, to combat that segregation that doesn't seem to go away, we're going to have to put the rental and the owner housing together. Um, I think it's also very important to bring people to near where they can work and where they can shop and where they can buy. That's another big problem is that we have communities that aren't anywhere near not only transportation but near job options and other sorts of uh, retail options. So I think I'm advocating again for a deliberate integration plan to plan to spread money through the metro region to spread uses and to create, scatter the money and create sustainable localities while thinking big picture in terms of where we get the funding, maybe breaking down those walls that were built legally by the political division of power in the uh, run-up to the Milken case. And um, 
I also think that we can use tax incentives to create stewardships for individual and group um, home upkeep and community upkeep. It's just more about social infrastructure, and I know that uh, we're going to have a little more on urban agriculture later. So let me just, one more thing about my thought, my mirror of what I see here is the idea of transforming Detroit instead of having two Detroits, having one Detroit with communities that are in themselves sustainable. And by sustainable, I mean not only um, having good options in terms of infrastructure and transportation, but in terms of diversity. Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. Um, oh, there's just, there's a big problem and it's very hard to solve it very quickly. But here are just some things to consider in terms of planning. Um, whether we need to have uh, prioritizing different housing types, as I mentioned, and planning and building a community that has transportation and walkability and those sorts of things. There are some legal problems in achieving this, and I think that as a lawyer, I think about those sorts of things too. Um, not only do we need to figure out where the problems are, which have been addressed a lot in Detroit since they've had this for a while, they can property ordinances and such. We need to see how control of property can be shifted. I don't just mean seize from people that aren't maintaining them right now, although that's part of it. Part of it has to do with um, governments working together because we actually have eight to 12 different parts of local governments that are holding different properties. And we need those to be centralized into one uh, planning and allocating entity. Um, we also need it to be repurposed. And to be repurposed, I don't think we want to keep government ownership. So the question is, how do we get it into hands of people who will have the right kind of stewardship um, of the property to have it achieve the best uses. Um, these are some ordinances and some approaches that are used to taking property that needs to be reallocated. And I just, I wouldn't fast, but we'll just go through. There's some other things that we have now that can help us, including new technologies. We also have new ways of getting financing and new ways to get subsidies. And if we can streamline approval processes to achieve these, then that would also get us there a little quicker. Finally, who's going to pay? Um, of course, people who are interested, investors or homeowners or residents can, can pay by paying to live in homes. Um, I think a rent-to-own model is very intriguing. Um, direct real estate investors, people that are um, interested in creating their own communities or developers, also a potential source of um, money, indirect real estate investors by having structures like a, like a real estate investment trust structure or maybe um, bonds or other creative financings and groups like land banks or community boot groups. Banks were part of the problem and I think should be held to pay for their fair share of the solution either through expanded liability or um, other, sorts of, uh, other sorts of tapping resources there. But I wanted to just leave you with another thought. I think that the federal government has a huge role to play in solving this mess. Um, as I mentioned, we have a history of HUD entities creating and perpetuating credit and, um, credit and segregation issues in this country. And I think that they need to step up and actually fund something that's going to solve it. Um, they need to funnel money not towards home ownership of single family homes in white external suburbs, but in terms of rental quality and affordability in cities and rebuilding urban, vibrant centers um, in deliberately creating integrated communities and in perhaps allowing rent to own as a path to build wealth. So this is again not a problem that we face alone in Detroit, it is throughout the country, but perhaps is felt most keenly here. And I do think that um, it is one of these key issues that if we can attack somewhere in this cycle, if we can get some housing integration, we're going to see a lot of other solutions flow just from that step. And I'll leave you finally with a, the Dr. King quote, because um, Detroit really once was a vibrant place, but it always had this problem. I think it can recapture its vibrancy and move to an even better place in the future if it can address and solve the problem of racial segregation in housing that has long plagued it and be able to move forward into an integrated future and offer a real American dream for all.
sure to note your thoughts and questions because that was a very rich discussion and we want to have a lot of discussion immediately after the next speaker. Thank you. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Shakira Sanders, and I teach constitutional law and criminal procedure at the University of Idaho College of Law. Um, I am going to talk to you today about the effects of ag-gag legislation on the Detroit urban farmer, and I am going to advocate for an ag-gag free Detroit. But before I do so, I would like to thank Catherine Ross, the symposium editor of the Law Review, and the Law Review itself here at the University of Detroit Mercy for the, uh, for the invitation to attend this important discussion about the past, present, and future of the city of Detroit. Many in this room were told that, it is, and it is true that I was born and raised in Detroit, I graduated from public elementary and high school uh, public schools in Detroit uh, before I attended a small liberal arts college on the East Coast. During the year in between graduating from college and attending law school, I returned home to Detroit and I worked as a community organizer at the Hunger Action Coalition of Michigan, which is one of many great nonprofits in the city. Um, one of my job duties at HAC was to um, help um, uh, find volunteers for our weekend summer camps. The participants in these camps were actually high school students from outside of Detroit who spent their weekends in the city volunteering at local community gardens. And you may be asking, why would our organization do this? Well, one is that HAC had received a federal grant at the time to promote and study urban farming in Detroit. Um, and and um, part of, of course, any hunger issue is food production and growth. Um, my time at the Hunger Action Coalition definitely sparked my interest in community and urban, gar urban garden, gardening. And I find it amazing that that experience will now, has now led to my participation um, on this panel today. So I am very proud of my Detroit roots, and I'm really excited uh, to discuss this topic with you. So what I thought I'd do is I have the discussion broken up into three parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is ag-gag legislation. Next, I'll turn to why it's important that a place like Detroit and its urban farmers be concerned about ag-gag legislation. And then I'll share with you my vision for an ag-gag-free Detroit. So what is ag-gag legislation? Well, recent legislative measures in a number of states, and I'm actually going to do away with this. I don't think I need it. I have a pretty loud voice. So legislation in a number of states um, has happened, and it's about a handful of states where they have sought to really prohibit individuals from going onto farms and videotaping the activities of those farms. And, and of course, a lot of this videotaping that we've seen shows all types of animal abusive practices with regards to animals, growing procedures, and those types of things. So uh, the concept of ag-gag was one that was initially uh, uh, coined by uh, a food journalist called, Mark, uh, his name was Mark Bittman. Um, and I use this term to refer to uh, any statute that is aimed at preventing the release of damaging information from inside of an agricultural or animal facility. In short, ag-gag legislation restricts or gags speech to the public about the conditions of food production. Now, states that have included these laws include Idaho, um, uh, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Montana, North Carolina, North Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, there is legislation pending in another other, or that was uh, rejected in other states, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, Nebraska, uh, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. So as you can see, this is sort of nationwide, and you can't really find a political uh, angle that will say why one state has passed at gag versus another. Um, I would say that there are four broad categories of ag gag style legislation. 
the first will criminalize an uh, the providing of false information with the intent to gain employment at an agricultural animal facility for purposes of recording images. The second category criminalizes entering an agricultural or animal facility for any reason and without the owner's consent and then using a camera, video recorder, or other video or audio recording uh, equipment within that facility. The third category deals with uh, a criminal laws for the failure to produce a recorded image of misconduct uh, to law enforcement within a certain amount of time. And the final category deals with uh, uh, preventing any type of legislation on the issue of animal welfare practices at agricultural at, uh, farms and facilities. Now, each state has sort of adopted one or more of these different types of categories. So for example, in Idaho, they have a very broad criminal statute that bans obtaining or releasing information about food production activities. It also criminalizes lying to an owner of a farm or facility uh, about your employment motives. Uh, and it imposes civil liability on the release of information that reflects poorly on the owner of that facility. And Idaho, in fact, says that you have to pay whatever the business loss is for that farm for the release of a video, you have to pay double of that business loss um, uh, that can occur from, from those activities. Um, so many of the states, the common reframe among states about why you want a law like this is that, well, we need to protect the property rights of the farm owners. Um, and, and, and there's this huge, and I, and I should uh, uh, sort of confess here, that the Idaho legislature is about 60 to 70 percent farmers. Um, and so they have found that there was a need to protect uh, farm or owners in the state of Idaho. You should also know about Idaho's ad gag law was that it was passed right after this very damaging video was released of uh, one of the huge dairy farmers within the state. And it was a pretty atrocious video that not only included physical abuse, uh, but some sexual abuse of, of cows as well. Okay, so opponents of these laws, of course, have argued that this, they do nothing but infringe on freedom of speech and press. It prevents the exposure of troubling practices at agricultural and animal farms and facilities. There are actually two federal challenges pending in these laws, and uh, the first is in Idaho this past August. Uh, a federal district chief judge of the federal district uh, court uh, of the district of Idaho actually uh, ruled Idaho's ad gag law unconstitutional, not only under uh, First Amendment principles of freedom of speech and press, but also equal protection with the idea that you're really targeting a specific type of business and giving them special protection, and there's really no need for Idaho to do that. Uh, uh, that case is actually uh, just got appealed to uh, uh, the Ninth Circuit, um, and so we'll see what uh, the, the Ninth Circuit has to say with Idaho with regards to its law. Uh, Utah's law is scheduled for trial this May. It is very likely that there will be summary judgment uh, motions filed in that case and that um, it, it could be resolved without uh, the need for a trial, although however that case goes, it is very likely that it will be appealed to the Tenth Circuit. Possibly setting up a circuit split amongst the ninth and tenth with regards to how they view both of these laws. And we know if there's a circuit split, that increases the chances that maybe the US Supreme Court will accept cert and review the cases as well. So that's sort of the ag gag landscape. I really want to focus my thoughts now on why should urban farmers in Detroit really even care? Michigan doesn't have an ad gat law. What is this? Why is this even important uh, for Detroit's future? Well, like I said, mo most of the controversy, current controversy around ad gat legislation, really focuses on the First Amendment. But I think that there is um, an, another constitutional principle that we should be concerned about, and that is economic protection 
by a particular state. This idea um, for, uh, I'm sure many of the students in the room may be having some nightmares when I say that word because it implicates constitutional law, though I'm sure you probably had a great time in your common law class with this idea that states are not allowed to pass laws for the sole benefit of protecting themselves economically, especially when those laws could have some effects out of states, uh, substantial effects out of states. So food production is clearly a topic that is in the public's interest. Um, and it is clearly a topic that is affected by what is now a global marketplace for food and food products. Um, regardless of where the ag gag law is passed, especially in the United States, um, it, there are some effects that occur, could occur out of state for these laws. So first of all, every farmer in the United States has their own federal, state, and local laws that they have to adhere to with regards to food production. Ag-gag legislation is designed to shield or hide bad business practices and acts of uh, that occur on agriculture farms and facilities. This in turn prevents the market and the public from re reflecting the disapproval of those bad acts or practices in that marketplace. So the rippling effects, I think, are one that are quite clear, and I think we saw that in the case of Idaho. The profits of this dairy farmer plummeted, and this was a global uh, provider, provider of food products. Uh, they had a plummet in their profits after this video was released. I think in the United States that there is an interconnectivity of our food production, which means that the potential impacts of ag-gag legislation does not stop at a particular state's borders. Farmers in non-ag-gag states could face, face economic disadvantages in the national market if they are competing with farmers from ag-gag states. In this sense, I think ag legislation is of a special importance for economically distressed cities like Detroit. For over a decade now, urban farming in this city has been the subject of much national discussion. And it is not anticipated that the topic will abate in the city of Detroit. I assert that ag ag legislative trends could jeopardize the Detroit's for urban farmers' ability to compete with other regional food producers. And I don't think that this assertion is mere speculation. The economic vulnerabilities in the city are not limited to commerce and real estate. Many Detroit neighborhoods are nutritionally challenged. And as a result, many Detroiters live in urban food deserts and are often forced to travel long distances to find healthy fare. Detroit community gardens and urban farms are expected to supply city residents with almost 30% of their daily allotment of vegetables and almost 20% of their allotment of fruits. Now recently, the city has announced plans to begin transferring public land to urban farmers for purposes of commercial and non-commercial food production. For example, uh, Mayor Dugan has announced a deal to, uh, a deal to a, uh, transfer almost 60 acres of city old land to Recovery Park's farming project. And this project would grow food commercially inside of the city and use the profits to uh, support drug addiction recovery agencies. Now I think that this plan is admirable and I think Recovery Park, uh, this project uh, represents an interesting method of government support co for commercial and urban food production. Uh, this project plans to convert 22 blocks of blight on the east side to a massive urban farm and Detroit's contribution includes the, a grant of 35 acres of land in addition to some monies. Um, and this project is expected to employ about 120 people at the three-year mark. And many of those workers will include uh, recovering addicts and ex-offenders. Uh, ex 
Um, now, Detroit's grant of land to Recovery Park does not come without stipulations. Um, ultimately, 60% of its workforce must be Detroit-based residents, and within a year, Discovery, uh, Recovery Park has to demolish or rehabilitate blighted buildings uh, within the uh, footprint of their farm. And if the park fails in any of its obligations, the city has the right and the ability to revoke its charter of land. It can take the land back. Now, so far, from what I've been able to research, none of the stipulations that apply to Recovery Park include a right to public access for purpose of gathering information about the conditions of food production. And my question to you is, why not? It is clear that food production is a topic of interest to the public. Consumers not only care about where their food comes from, but the conditions under which that food is cultivated, grown, or raised. Food production and safety, I think, are especially important in communities like Detroit, where large populations are vulnerable to food insecurity and other environmental justices. Next, I'd like to argue in support of an ag-gag-free Detroit. And I will attempt to provide a few guiding principles uh, for Detroit to think about um, in support of this effort. So what am I talking about when I say I want an ag-gag-free Detroit? Well, one thing I think about is not criminalizing people who lawfully access these public lands, even though they may be leased by private uh, urban farms or individuals. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that if the city is going to be giving out its public land, that it owns in trust for the benefit of the public, then there needs to be certain rules about what happens on that land. And it's clear that the city has thought about that. There are conditions. But I don't see any conditions that involve the public's ability and the public's right to know about those practices of food production and farm uh, activities. Now, at the outset, I'd like to make clear that Detroit should not seek to ban or limit the import of products from ag, gag, states, or any other state. I think such attempts will likely run afoul of constitutional pr principles that prohibit state and local regulation of interstate commerce. But nothing should stop Detroit from affirming its intent to remain ag-gag free, especially with regards to urban agricultural uh, agriculture and animal farms that benefit from the grant of city land and other tangible resources. Now, I think that Detroit could remain ag gag free or at least affirm its intent to remain ag gag free by adhering to or adopting any number of principles. And I'm going to talk about three. Um, first, I think Detroit should encourage or require public access to animal, to aggregate agriculture and animal farms and facilities that are, are receipts of uh, recipients of city grants, land grants. Second, I think Detroit should require or continue to require absolute compliance with state, federal, and local laws uh, for those recipients of city-owned land grants. And finally, I think Detroit should uh, engage in the creation of a cooperative body for compliance and oversight. So I'll talk a little bit about each one of these principles. Uh, the first is encouraging or requiring public access to agricultural and animal farms and facilities that are the recipients of uh, city land grants. Now, this principle is naturally limited by federal, state, um, civil and criminal laws related to privacy ownership and, and, and privacy and property ownership. Thus, laws related to trespass, conversion, burglary, theft, unlawful access, all those laws should still apply. But I contemplate an ag gag free Detroit. And therefore, there should be some effort to promote open access to agriculture and animal farms and facilities, at least those that are the recipients of the city-owned land. 
I think that this can be done in a way that encourages speech to the public about the conditions of food production. Detroit may also want to consider whether to create an ag gag free zone in its urban farming districts and encourage farmers to label their products as grown in an ag gag free Detroit. My second principle is requiring absolute compliance with state, federal, and local laws uh, for purposes of agriculture and food production. Now, this is more than just a general agreement, right? Everyone agrees to follow the law. This should be a condition to the grant of land. Upon the finding of a violation, Detroit's grant of the land could or should be revoked, and ownership should revert back to the city and its residents. Now, such a requirement is not unlike the conditions that Detroit has already imposed on Recovery Park, Recovery Park um, which uh, again has agreed to all types of conditions or face the loss of land. Now again, I think this should be designed to promote speech about the conditions from inside of an agriculture or animal facility that produces food for public consumption. The public has a right to know about the conditions under which food is cultivated, grown, or raised, especially, again, in Detroit, where large populations are vulnerable to food insecurity and environmental injustices. Finally, um, my last idea was the creation of a co cooperative body for compliance and oversight. Now here I contemplate an agricultural council that includes city officials, farmers, and community members. I think the recent events due north of Detroit has increased our awareness of the need for public scrutiny of our natural resources, including access to safe water, air, and food. The Flint crisis demonstrates the interconnectedness of our natural resources and our constitutional guarantee of life and liberty. Decades of pollution has led or did lead to the contamination of a vital natural resource. Our collective lack of due stewardship ultimately led to the poisoning of city residents. It should also be noted that Flint residents lacked any collective say in the use or abuse of their own natural resources. So here I think we should design a public oversight board um, that looks into the activities on Detroit land grants, even uh, both commercial and non-commercial. Detroit's nutri nutrition crisis, I think, creates a special need to provide healthy food. In the future, Detroit's community gardens and urban farms are expected to supply city residents with increasing amounts of food and vegetables. And city residents have a right to ensure that, that uh, farmers are in compliance with laws that relate to food production and food safety. To conclude, the future success of Detroit's urban farming movement depends on public trust. And public trust must be earned one way to do that is to encourage open access and open monitoring to ensure absolute compli compliance with laws, especially those laws that relate to food production. These are in, of heightened importance to the public and strike at core constitutional values, especially where a city provides land for such activities. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. We you know, recognize that with Detroit having filed for bankruptcy, we are literally and figuratively at ground zero. And your respective comments focused on the one hand, primarily on the housing issue, and gave us a very thorough uh, sort of historical understanding of that. And on the other hand, Professor, you're proposing that we expand our industries to incorporate agribusiness, I assume. So what I'd like to do, and then of course I invite comments, is to try and, with that dichotomy present, housing and agribusiness, is to go first to Professor Boyack, 
and talk a little bit about a comment that you made that I found interesting when you said that it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to become homeowners. And as a result, you sort of propose that we might look at some alternatives. And I wanted you to kind of flush that out a little bit more because, of course, each state, uh, Michigan in particular, has the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, for example. And I was the chair of that board at one point. So we devoted a lot of time to trying to find ways to integrate everyone into the American dream of home ownership. Talk a little bit, you know, about why that's becoming increasingly difficult, what you think boards like MISHTA need to do. I'll sort of flush that out a little bit for us, if you would. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. um, well, I think it's really interesting. We've, there's been a lot of uh, demographic studies that I've looked at lately that are showing the preference for home ownership is actually, oh, I'm sorry, I, somehow a lot is going on. <laughs> is decreasing um, in all segments of society as you get younger. So the highest level of homeowners right now are the oldest segments of society and the youngest uh, people in society are less likely to be homeowners. And a lot of that has been been uh, blamed, I should say, on, on increasing debt, especially student debt for younger people. But some of it is actually shown by preference. Um, I think one, one uh, outcome of the crisis has been that sort of the blooms off the rose a little bit of home ownership. Some people said, oh, I will do anything, I'll sacrifice anything for home ownership. Well, you had people that were liquidating their retirement accounts so they could enter into a loan that was not a sustainable loan then they lose everything that they ever had when the loan went bad and end up worse off than they were to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so, although we have looked at home ownership as a way to build wealth, which is, is incredibly important. I mean, there's like a 900% wealth gap or something of racism in the country. Um, it's not necessarily as effective as it first seems. And actually, there's some very interesting empirical work done on wealth building in different communities. And they've shown that minority home ownership is less likely to grow well than um, white home ownership for whatever reason, and let's put it different ways. Um, there's also a preference, I think, for people living in a more urban environment generally that you have among the rising millennial generations. I think that you can have wealth building at some sort of hybrid level where you kind of hit both of these things. Maybe you can have a rent-to-own situation where people could not have to liquidate all of their assets and, and savings and enter into risky sorts of endeavors and put their own wealth at risk in order to become homeowners as if that's some sort of magic thing, but you could do something in a less risky way. Um, it, would just, it would require tweaking some of the, the treatment of rentals and it would maybe allow you to build some portion of equity through a rental situation rather than an ownership situation. One thing that I point out a lot to my students in real estate financing types of classes is that renting and, and mortgage paying is financially almost the same thing, um, but we treat it as differently in this country in a lot of different ways. And for one example, um, it's not considered a positive credit indicator to pay your rent on time, whereas it's considered a positive credit indicator to pay payments towards your credit card. Um, this is a very strange thing, and I know the Center of American Progress has taken an issue with that for one thing, um, because if you are uh, in a community of renters and you've been paying rent, you actually have a very good chance of being a consistent mortgage payer, mm. and yet for some reason our our credit rating age, our credit rating approach is not taking that into account. Um, so part of it has to do with, with changing how we're, how we're defining credit, but part of it has to do with maybe finding alternative pathways to wealth building other than putting all that at risk. But as you indicated, we have all of this uh, vacant land. Yeah. And so the question becomes, what do we do with it? Now, I know what you want to do with it, um, <laughs> Professor. I actually think that that's Sanders, a great idea. But, uh, <laughs> right, but I mean, in an urban environment, yeah. certainly we cannot. And I mean, Detroit historically has had one of the highest rates of single family owned ownership, uh, home ownership in the country. Now, we're not there now, but historically it was known because you had at that point one industry, the automobile industry, that funded homes and fueled that middle class wealth building. And so now as we look at Detroit being at ground zero, 
what are we saying to the offspring of those children, I guess, or those families and those people who have now passed on? Many of them are losing homes through tax foreclosure. And so, you know, fundamentally, that housing issue is pivotal in rebuilding Detroit. So just wondered about your thoughts there. No, I think, I think it's really important to think about this. And, and, I, and when I'm thinking of home ownership versus rental, I also don't mean that rental housing is in a building, like a multifamily building over here and single families over here and the single families are always homeowners. Um, actually, the biggest growing segment, the biggest growing demand for rental housing right now is a single family home. Mm. And so if you put that in sort of a, a rent to own model, and I guess I'm really talking about allocating risk, that you don't have the people who are trying to build wealth through, through home equity, maybe putting up the same level of risk as an owner and putting in less risk um, as you would see in a rental situation. Mm -hmm. But I also just think that it's maybe a way to, to think a little bit less traditionally, a way of creating a more sustainable home ownership model for the non-traditional homeowner. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is it's a lot easier to become a homeowner as a white person. Um, even if you say, oh, I have the exact same education, I have the exact same job, but the fact is, is that I have a family history of, of more home ownership and more credit uh, available to me. I think that because the federal government, the HUD, had spent so much allocation of resources through the 40s and 50s and 60s, basically helping white people become owners. What we don't want to do, of course, is say, oh, well, that's gone. Now nobody can become owners, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think ownership is, in and of itself, necessarily the only way to achieve the goals that we're using it as a proxy for. Mm -hmm. um, if it, the goal is that we're building wealth and we're build, giving a civic responsibility, maybe we need to have there be a way to grow wealth and become civically involved and invested in community as a renter, rather than wait until somebody becomes a homeowner and only then can you get to that level, that mm -hmm. threshold. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Any questions on this topic? Yes, please. Professor Sanders, how would your no ag gag urban farming fit into Professor Boyack's model for a better urban community? Well, I think that's one of the nice things about these two projects being together is, is the blight in the city is what has created the opportunities for so much of the urban farming that, to be clear, has been going on for decades now in the city of Detroit. And so I, I see one of the, another thought I have about this is a lot of this is, is, is sort of in popular culture, we think of it as sort of the farm to table movement, this idea that you can go out and pick out the chicken you're gonna have that night at the restaurant and, 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 and that makes you feel better about um, eating, eating <laughs> out. Um, and, and, or maybe that's something that only happens in the Northwest. Um, so, um, so I think one of the great things is that these farms become part of the communities. Uh, you know the people who are growing the food that you're gonna eat. It's more likely that you have more trust um, and what they're doing, and I think that open access, and I, and I don't mean completely open access, but I think there's this idea that the growers are just as much a, a part of that community as the residents in the community, in the schools, in the playgrounds, and so I sort of envision uh, the, the farms becoming almost like parks um, in the city, which you can see in, in other urban places like Seattle. Where, I, where I've lived before, there were sort of urban gardens that are also just public parks. One thing I wanted to say is, uh, I think part of my reasoning for shifting from focusing just exclusively on home ownership and focusing on more integrated communities is that I like the model of trying to create something that brings people together. And I, I, for that reason, something like a community garden or urban agriculture is a great idea because you don't only focus on, okay, we're gonna put this person in a home, this person in a home, this person in a home. We're gonna put these people in a neighborhood. And we're gonna have ways that they can interact. Um, when you look today at some of the terrible hate and, and biases that people have, and even in the younger generation, it's quite disheartening. And I think a lot of the, in my mind, the only way you can really combat that is by bringing people together. And, and that's what, in some ways, was very nice when we hear that first panel and they mentioned, even in these terrible race riots back, you know, 100 years ago, there were people who, who came together out of that. And so I think that um, if you have structures, whether it's we're gonna have diverse types of residences and housing so that people of all different means can live in the same place, and then you have places where they can work together, and places where they can 
fraternize in places where they can bond. It's going to sort of lay the groundwork for eventually, and it you know, might take a generation or two, but eventually having a place where you, you actually feel integrated with people of different financial backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds and different ethnic backgrounds and different racial backgrounds, and all of that's not gonna really matter because you're all part of the community. And so I think both of these are sort of community focus as opposed to an individual focus, which for so long our housing law was about, with building individuals' home ownership rather than communities that work. And it's really holistic development because this is a multi-dimensional problem, and of course the solutions are simplistic. This we know. Other questions, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you both professors for talking uh, today. Um, Professor Boy, I, I have a question. You've already sort of touched on it. Um, you talked about amassing wealth, not just through home ownership. Um, could you maybe expand on how you think um, these ideas of community gardens might help promote the growth of wealth? Well, sure. I mean, you can have ownership or participation in ventures like a garden or other sorts of uh, businesses that are local as well. In fact, uh, there's a lot to be said economically about not being completely invested in your real estate. It's a, it's a risky investment. It's, it's inherently a liquid, and you're putting all of your money into something that's fairly variable based on relative values. Um, if you have things that have a little bit more um, linkage to intrinsic market uh, valuations like a business, agribusiness or another sort of business, I would think that that's going to help diversify your portfolio in a way. Yeah, and I think on that too, um, it's, I think there are economic benefits that come from not having to pay to import your food, which is better for the environment. I think there's sort of like the auto industry. It's not just about the factory. It's about all the other businesses that are needed. Uh, to, to distribute that product and uh, to build and distribute and I think you can say the same thing about uh, agriculture and, and it's essential right it's, it's not that we will never have to need to grow food we will always need to grow food and, and, and there are, I think there's also just a certain poetic, poetic beauty to growing food locally and, and knowing where it's coming from and so I think that there is some value that is linked to the land, right? We need land for housing and we need land for food. And I think there's a way that those two um, could, could coexist. Um, and then finally I'll say it's, it's about educating. I think there's a huge part of this that is about educating people how to grow their own food. Um, and I think that's something that is, is very important as well. Yes, I have a question for Professor um, Boyan. You talk about rent to own as an alternative method of home ownership and how do you envision this being financed? I mean, when we look at, particularly for low-income individuals, we look at the amount of government subsidies in any type of affordable housing, which can run to 60 to 70 percent of the cost of that. How do you envision this type of thing being be, be financed? I think maybe we need to think of um, people earning some sort of ownership right so some sort of ownership percentage based on, on effort and stewardship and not just in terms of capital expended. So if you could create a situation where people who are living in their housing, whether it's a single family home or multifamily, would contribute to upkeep or contribute to a stewardship, that that maybe would actually be a way to build equity. This is, a, this is right now really limited to owners, right? We, we call it sweat equity. You own your house, you go out and you paint it, and you're building wealth for yourself. Now if I'm a renter, there's no reason I go paint my house because I'm just giving value to my landlord. But if you had a way to allocate effort towards you know, the improvement effort, the stewardship effort, not only are you combating a problem that you see in rental housing where people don't care, right? They say, well, why should I keep this up? It's not my house. That would be a vehicle to get them to care, and it would be a vehicle to, to help them translate their labor into an actual asset. Isn't that a, such a relatively small cost, though? I mean, how long would it take to accumulate this so that the renter would actually have any sense, a real sense of ownership? I think that maybe we need to think of ownership in a, less, in a more disaggregated sense, and that maybe you aren't owning the property as far as owning 100% of the value. 
we, we live in this fiction anyway that people that are buying homes are 100% owners of the value. When people had 2% down payment homes, they did not own 100% of the value, but they thought they did. Um, but if you have the idea that, okay, I'm sharing in the appreciation of this asset, and there is a way to, to liquidate and take that, even if it's a small amount, it's better than no amount, and you're creating incentives to them allocating that labor, which we want them to do anyway. So getting a little bit of return, it, sure, you don't become the owner, but you're growing an asset value that you can share in the appreciation. So it's sort of like thinking out of the normal home ownership model completely and saying instead of thinking in this dual approach, okay, you're a renter or you're an owner, there's something in between where you're a participating renter or something well, like that. Well, Huck's done something in the past along those lines with, with the loan forgiveness mm -hmm. or the, um, the um, grant forgiveness if you stay yeah. in the home for a period of time. They talk about, but that's an interesting idea. Right. It kind of picks up on that concept. Sure, except for that is only for ownership as right. opposed to someone that couldn't get into the door of ownership to begin with. <coughs> that's right, thanks. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, don't we really have two models of rent to own? Because of course it, it depends upon who owns. Yeah. I mean, here in Detroit, we have, for example, the Wayne County Land Bank. Mm -hmm and the Detroit Land Bank. And both of those entities actually hold <coughs> land, which could be used for your purposes. Right. And so you could have a rent to own model that derived from that, because the fee simple interest would be vested in the city right, or like the a county. Right, that's going to, it's exactly. uh, their whole attention is to get it in the hands. That's of right, so then you've got a pure rent to own from the city. But of course, the city and the county don't want to be in that business. So they ultimately look for nonprofits. But then the other model is the land contract model, mm -hmm. where we have seller financing and people actually on their own, for whatever reason, opt to enter into an agreement with a homeowner. <coughs> so there, it's different. I don't know if we have the same issue with costs, but I just wanted to clarify. You're talking about people purchasing from the government. The problem in the installment loan contract is that we don't have enough legal protections right now for Absolutely. people as they're getting there. And it's Nor is only, there enough knowledge. First of all, on it's only going to be liquid capital that's going to count. But, but the second thing is they don't have the kinds of ownership protections that you would have in a, in a traditional uh, mortgage lending kind of way. And so it puts people, and, and the, the whole point, which I think it should be, is to eliminate the risk for the people who are the most vulnerable. It actually puts more risk on people that are most vulnerable. So it's not a bad idea financially, but as currently constituted, constituted is definitely not sufficient. And, and I would say um, that is an issue with, with farming as well. Not everyone wants to farm on own land that's owned by the city. Some people want to buy land and set up their own farms, and so I think these same concerns about ability to obtain financing um, and, and different ways of thinking about ownership could definitely apply uh, in the, in the uh, food production context as well. Questions, questions? Thank you, please. We to talk about a new phrase I just learned today, zombie foreclosures. <laughs> so, the bank gets out of the subprime mortgage, the person can't make the payments, they get the note saying you better, you know, move out because we're going to take it over. So they move out, and the bank looks at the property, says it's not worth the effort, and just abandons it in place. So the title to the property is still in the previous owner, Hit the road and maybe in a different town by now. The bank doesn't want to keep it up, and that creates urban void. Now, wouldn't a municipality or a government agency have a cause of action under a nuisance theory against the banks that gave out the zombie mortgage or doing the zombie foreclosure process? You or creating a nuisance condition that has a negative impact on the community? That's a great idea, and they tried it in Cleveland, yeah. and it didn't work. <laughs> but the, 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 the concept, of course, the problem with nuisance laws, it's pretty unpredictable to see how it's going to apply because it's so um, indeterminate. But what has been more successful 
in addressing the exact same problem has been legislative efforts that have said if your property, if the property that you are the lender of, not the, not the title owner, but if you are the lender on a property, and that property becomes unowned, you have to register it with the municipality, and then you're going to have to pay some sort of fee, and you're going to have to maintain it, and there have been legislative efforts to directly make the mortgage holder uh, financially responsible for upkeep. There's also, I think someone mentioned previously in a different panel, there's also been, uh, in response to a question I believe it was, there have also been efforts to hold liable the banks for the costs of um, like uh, light removal or demolition or repurposing or something like that. But it's a very interesting thing because it's sort of the flip side of this question of risk of an ownership, right? The banks have put in the majority of capital and often not their own money anyway, you know, money that funneled through the subprime lending securitization beast. And they were the majority holder of the interest of the home in a financial way, but they weren't the owner. So when the owner has been told, leave, you're under foreclosure and they've left, the banks try to have their cake and eat it too and wash their hands and say, well, I don't, I don't own that property, so therefore I don't have to pay. And legally, they're not on the hook to pay property taxes or these other things. That, that other owner who's, who's left town maybe unwittingly is still accruing those things. And it's actually very hard to take property out of that owner's hands and put it into the bank's hands or anyone else's hands. And this is the zombie mortgage problem, is that people all of a sudden get told, by the way, you owe all this money in uh, demolition of your blighted house. And I said, what are you talking about? Four years ago, I left that house because I was told it was under foreclosure. Well, the lender never finished the foreclosure. And we don't legally have a way to force lenders to finish foreclosures, um, yet at least. But we do have the ability more and more with legislative efforts to have the lenders be on the hook for certain costs, and then there's this liability issue, which is interesting. And I don't know if the nuisance is completely off the table. I would like to see some other cases. Uh, that was brought as sort of like a class action that you brought this public nuisance upon the city of, of Cleveland through your lending efforts, and it wasn't very early after the crisis, and maybe there wasn't yet the political will to follow that through, but there's clearly some responsibility on the lenders, and they should be paying some of the costs of dealing with the blighted properties and getting the properties into the right, you know, getting that cost allocated to the right responsible parties is, is challenging under the current legal structure. Very good. Some closing comments here, because I think we're wrapping up. So Professor Sanders, if you would. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to uh, attend this symposium. Um, it was a really, really just so informative um, and, and exciting to be part of this effort. Um, I look forward to writing this article for the Law Review. I promise it will be on time. Um, <laughs> Um, it's on, it's on uh, recording. So. Yes, that it, is, it, is, it, is, on it, is, it is on the record now. Um, and, and I'd just like to encourage all of the students in the room to um, really become an active members of the, of the bar if you choose to stay here or wherever you go to get involved in this. When we think about the future of Detroit, you guys are actually the future of Detroit. And I think there's going to be so much opportunity with you, uh, for you in your practice, to really think outside of the block, block, uh, uh, box and, and, and change the rules on, on what we do as lawyers. And I really look forward to hearing stories about the graduates of this law school going out and, and becoming really a positive part of the future of Detroit. Thanks. Thanks. I talked a lot, I won't go too long. I just, I think that's, I, I reiterate everything that's been said. This is a tremendous moment of opportunity. I think it's very easy to focus on what's wrong and there's a lot wrong, but you know, that's why people are needed to care. And whether they're, they're lawyers or urban planners or they're, they're other socially minded people, they're people who are willing to put forth the effort to understand the problem and try to creatively think of solutions. And some will work and some won't work. But I think that uh, you think about the history of Detroit and it's, been, it's a pretty amazing place in terms of its, its human capital um, and in terms of so many things. And uh, at this moment of opportunity, I hope we can seize it. And I really hope that we can, in the future, come together rather than break apart. Exactly. Well, I would like to, let's acknowledge our great speaker. <laughs> thank you so much for coming and for sharing in this moment. And I would like to commend the Law Review Board, the professors, the dean, for having, again, the vision 
for this very important, very important moment in Detroit's history. In many respects, we're urban pioneers and have an opportunity to make sure that moving forward, Detroit recaptures the rich history that it has already and always had. So thank you so much again, and thank you for inviting me to be the moderator.